I want to do something a little different in this session. I'd like to read a segment out of a wonderful book. It's called Palestine, Land of My Adoption. The author, J.W. Clapham, was a New Zealand school teacher. He was traveling to England in the summertime and decided to stop in what was then Palestine, British-controlled Palestine. And as he toured about, he was overwhelmed with the fact that in this country where the church began, there really were no evangelical New Testament churches. And so God burdened his heart one night as he sat looking down over Haifa Harbor from Mount Carmel to contact his employer back in New Zealand and say that he wasn't coming home. And he stayed on there for several years, 1928, 29, and 30. Uh, didn't stay in five-star hotels. He used a tent and a sleeping bag and traveled from place to place preaching the gospel looking for opportunities for the gospel. And God blessed him in a mighty way. In those few years, he saw New Testament churches established in Jaffa and in Haifa and in Jerusalem and in Tel Aviv. And the work in Tel Aviv by this time had close to 60 in happy fellowship. Then he returned to New Zealand and married a wife and returned back to the Middle East and God used him in seeing the establishment of a fellowship of Armenian believers in Beirut, Lebanon. And he also worked in Nicosia, Cyprus, in Egypt, in several places in Egypt, as well as in Istanbul, Turkey. And God used him in wonderful ways. Well, he's a beautiful writer. You would very much enjoy this book, Palestine, Land of My Adoption. And I'm just going to read you a page out of it, one incident, and this is what he says. There was one incident I noted in the day's harvesting at Cana which would interest any Bible student. Under the Mosaic law, it was permitted for the poor to pick up the gleanings of the harvest fields, to reap the corners of the fields, and to gather the last fruit or berries from the orchard. The rule is still observed in Palestine. I notice that a poor widow woman has been following up the harvesters all day, methodically gleaning straw by straw. We watch her with intense interest, but alas, there is no kind Boaz, so far as we could see, in the field today. Nonetheless, by the time the western sun dips down behind the Carmel Range, filling all Galilee with delicate shades of color, the widow is wending homeward with three or four fat sheaves to her credit. Through faulty reasoning, this modern Ruth has decided to give the threshing floor a wide berth. What are three or four sheaves to a great government seems to be her line of argument. But it so happened that very day, the governor of Nazareth had ridden over to visit the village. He is an abrupt young Australian who served in Palestine in the First Great War. The woman, bowed beneath the weight of her sheaves, her eyes fastened to the ground, is traversing the last narrow alleyway leading to her stone hovel, when, to her great surprise and consternation, she finds herself confronting the governor. What is this? Where are you taking these sheaves? He demands in tones of severity. Much taken aback, the woman pleads her poverty and widowhood, but the governor, an outspoken young officer of the law, is adamant. Disputes in the Middle East are usually conducted in public, and soon many heads and necks are thrust from neighboring doors to listen to the angry chiding. Nor is this the end of the matter, for as he turns away, he bids her appear, without fail, at the local court at Nazareth on the following day. That evening, as we addressed the villagers who had gathered upon the rooftop of our host's house in the moonlight to hear the gospel story, we heard some rather unfavorable comments about the apparent harsh conduct of the British governor towards the poor widow. Comments which, as a Britisher, I was naturally sorry to hear. Next morning, very early, the widow came to my host's house to borrow a donkey, 
and placing upon it the sheaves she had gleaned the day before, we saw her wending her way slowly and no doubt sadly up the steep ascent leading from Cana to Nazareth. At the court of the governor, he was still adamant, despite the woman's plea of poverty and widowhood. If I acquit you, others will do the same thing. No, the law must be carried out. You must know you have no possible right to take wheat home from the harvest field. I must find you twelve piastres. Then with a quick, almost unobserved movement, as he calls for the next case, he flings the twelve piastres from his own purse across to the clerk, bidding him in an undertone to make out a receipt in favor of the poor lawbreaker. Completely mystified, the woman doesn't know for what reason she has received the paper. No wonder there was much discussion that night in Cana concerning the strange case of the widow and her fine. These English are very strange people, said certain of the wise heads of the village. Who before in the history of the land ever heard of a judge who wanted to fine himself? This, of course, is the classic story of the gospel, isn't it? That God is both righteous and merciful, and he must receive full payment, but he receives it at his own son's hand. And so we read these beautiful words in Colossians chapter 1. It pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. It was for him, but it was by him, that the price was paid through his own precious blood upon his own cross, that the Lord Jesus, the judge of all, becomes the savior of all who believe. He charged the debt. He charged the righteous judgment. But then he paid the debt in full. And so by himself, he sought to reconcile those who had been lawbreakers and bring peace through the blood of his cross.